Well, I don't know about you, but I will take a sunny and cool Saturday morning any day over all the snow they're having back east. Good morning and happy Saturday. Glad you're here with us on Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, your KTR, KTAR car guy, and Dave Riccio decided to take the weekend off, so I've brought Kevin Nelson from I-17 Collision. I called you Kevin Nelson. It's Kevin Rowe from I-17, Kevin Rowe. I-17 Collision and Tim Nelson from Virginia Auto Service to help out. And as always, we're here every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on KTAR. We're putting you in the know when it comes to car stuff. And we're here to help you, so we encourage you to call in if you have any questions or want to participate at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, we have Body Shop Day. Kevin from I-17, as I said, is here to help us with all your body work, paint work questions, anything you have to do with a, with a car and paint or an accident. Of course, open phones. And what should I do after having an accident? Or maybe, what should we do to be prepared so when we have an accident? Kevin, I'm sure you see, I mean, every day you're getting cars that are wrecked. Yep. They're coming in. People are either the victim, if you will. They've Mm -hmm. been clobbered. They're the, ooh, that was my fault. Yep, yep. They're they're not as happy. But what what do we do? I mean. Well, the, the first thing I recommend, I run into it all the time, is make sure you have adequate coverage. I have stories that come in. Um, I like your your line that you were talking about this morning, yeah, Matt. There, there's two people, th- those who have had an accident and those are go- that are going to have an accident. Exactly. I'm going to make some brochures with that or something because that's just genius. But what happens is, is people have this idea that it's never going to happen to me and their coverage doesn't support uh, their, their type of vehicle. Um, they just don't have coverage and it happens a lot to where I see I have liability only, and I can't get my car fixed. So that's the first thing. Don't think, don't ever think it's not going to happen to you. Unfortunately, it's happened to me way too many times. Well, and you were telling <laughs> me a story of a friend who had a late model truck, like a 2009 yeah. or 10. It was paid off, and whether he forgot and said, "Oh, I can save a thousand bucks a year and not have full coverage because it, it's never going to happen to me," yep. or maybe the agent had the bright idea, gets in a wreck, it's his fault. The truck totals out, and sorry, dude, and you, yeah, you're going to have to go car shopping. Yeah, <laughs> so be prepared. I guess the be first prepared. thing is is be prepared to have good coverage, so that when and you notice I say when you have an exactly. accident, that that you can get your car fixed. But um, having some things in the car, yep. um, you want to have. You know, we all have our. A lot of people have smartphones and phones that can take pictures. If you have one of those, great. Maybe an uh, old disposable, not even old. You know, you get the yeah. Kodak camera for ten bucks and. Yep. Throw it in the glove box. Of course, you got to have your registration and insurance. Yeah, you have a kit together already set up to where you have everything all in one place, a, a, a pen or a pencil, some paper, um, the registration. Make sure you have your license and your insurance, your valid insurance card. A lot of people, oh, it, it lapsed, and then they're going to have to go down to court. You know, obviously, they're you know they're going to have to prove that they were insured at that time. It just you know takes more time out of their life to to facilitate all of that. Well, but let's talk about okay. So there's the paperwork side there's being paperwork, prepared. Yeah. Let's call that the administrative part. You right. need to administratively make sure that you're taken care of and have your your ducks in a row, so that if you have an accident, you're covered and, mm-hmm. and you've got the stuff to take some reports, take some notes on the side or some pictures, but. What about on the – I mean, if you're on the freeway, I mean, one of the first things, make sure everybody's okay. Right. Stay safe. Safety right? is rule one. Yeah. It's – if you're in rush hour traffic, you're on the freeway, and it's not a major collision, try to find a way to get out of traffic um, with your vehicles, making sure both parties who are in the collision, you know. Get off. Get off safely. Make sure that everybody is not injured. Mm-hmm. Um, severely, sometimes things sneak up the you know day or two after whiplash or whatever. But as long as uh, you don't need to call an ambulance, just you know safety is the first consideration with everything. Well, so. and there's that part of safety, but then you know we've heard of scams before, where two people go and one person stops, causes the next person to rear end, a little insurance scam. Yep. Or you know maybe you're in a bad part of town. Maybe it's one o'clock in the morning, and I don't know you're driving through the hood, whatever that description in your right. brain is. And, you know, let's just say it's a dark road and out of the blue, someone rear ends you. It doesn't make sense. Well, maybe you just don't need to pull over. Maybe you need to drive the next mile to the Circle K. Sure. And get to a well-lit – because you got to think about 
not just your injury or being on the side of the road and maybe getting hit by another car, but your personal safety. Are you being scammed possibly? Or- exactly. And in, in, in light of that also, at, at the same time in that situation, I would call the police um, to and then don't have any contact with the person that you got in the uh, collision with other than, hey, I've, I've called the police. They're on their way. Let's hang tight until they show up. You know? Right. And, and, and so – that's in, if you're in a bad situation, if you're mm-hmm. in a good – I don't know if there is a good situation when having an accident, but we were talking about this. Row. You don't want to get in a fight and start debating whose fault it is on the side of the road because that's – number one, it's not going to get settled there. Right. Even if you're right, I guarantee the other person thinks they're right. And it's you- all perception. <laughs> it, it's, it's like, well, what I thought I saw happen, you know, when I was driving when we got in the wreck and the person who – I collided with or collided with me. Their perception is different at the same time. And, yeah, you know, you hear the stories of the road rage, and it's, it's a difficult situation to begin to begin with right off the bat. High you know, stress. High yeah. stress. You don't want to get into a shouting match or an, a debate over whose fault it was. Leave that, you know, leave that to the police officer when he comes out to take the report, gather the information from both sides. And uh, and then you know make the judgment call from there with the insurance. Well, so. and the, I mean it's the insurance companies, even the police, I, they'll determine. They can't determine it who's at fault. That's for the court to do. They don't get yeah. to be judge and jury. But they're gonna their story is gonna have an indication. It will. Yeah, they're, and, they're the impartial uh, third party um, right. that comes in. They, they gather information and then that's used by the insurance companies to determine who's legitimately after and they do this insurance companies do this hundreds of thousands of times a week probably oh, yeah. or a month oh yeah they know what they're doing yeah they okay so we've covered that we've covered the safety well i'll tell you i'll be damned <laughs> <laughs> i laugh now but i'm driving to work i go down the 51 and i exit thomas yesterday morning 7 30 and i'm thinking okay i know dave's not going to be in tomorrow kevin's coming in what are we going to talk about? So I'm talking about thinking, okay, body shop. What do we do? We get in an accident. Smack. I hit the car in front of me. Said, <laughs> he, uh, he came in in a good mood yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I was so <laughs> mad. But, but so I'm the example. I can laugh now. It was no big deal. Nobody was hurt, although, you know. <laughs> Other than your pride a little bit, maybe. <laughs> Other, well, yeah. you know, it was my fault. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no doubt about that. That's that. I mean, she went. She stopped, thought traffic was going to go. I looked up, saw her moving. I let my foot off the gas. Yep. I, and never, or let my foot off the brake and just coasted and touched her. Yep. I mean, I had a brand new uh, tea from my favorite Lucy's uh, joint down here in 16th and Bethany, and I didn't spill any of it. So I know I didn't hit her that hard. But what drove me crazy, she didn't want to move out of the intersection. I'm like, mm-hmm. there's people behind us. Come on, they're honking. Yep. And we move. And, you know, I can't find, I had my, well, I had my insurance card. On my smartphone, on my iPhone, I had a picture of it. So mm-hmm. that was good. I think that's a good way to store your documents. Yep. Take a picture of your registration. Take maybe a picture of your driver's license. Take a picture of your insurance card. And what I was able to do with her yesterday was just text it to her. We had to trade information. And I said, well, instead of writing all this down, what's your cell phone number? I'll just text it to you. So that worked out well for us to have that. Now, I didn't, I didn't have the registration. I had an expired one. Yeah. And, of course, now we can talk about the police. Should we always call the police? I say no. If it's if it's very minor, I would say I would agree with you. Um, there there's times where I've seen it though where um, people have good intentions, but it's one of those things—the perception thing where it's like I thought this, but the other person thinks this, and yeah. to have that uh, to have that documentation. Um, by the time or so when you get into the actual shop to get it repaired and mm-hmm. for insurance clarification. So the adjusters on both sides of the insurance companies have good information and, and not conflicting stories. If, it, if it's more than just a minor thing, I would say my rule of thumb, what I reckon, recommend to my customers is, is get the police involved. Yeah. See, and yesterday I was a little frustrated and I, I don't tend to get my cage rattled like most people might or like a few might. And so I was like, really call the police? There's, I mean, it didn't even break a lens. In that case, mm-hmm. I would call that extremely minor. I, I guess you have to make that split-second judgment call. If, you know, am I dealing with some guy that looks like a degenerate? I don't think I do. Right. No, <laughs> you know, no you I, don't. I had my ID. I had a business card. My <laughs> business card has my picture on it. Um, you know, so I was a little frustrated. But then the police got there. Of course, they didn't take a report. I felt like it just wasted a little bit of time. But mm-hmm. if you are if you have broken glass and you have fluid leaking, yeah, yeah get get that. Always, we talked about sometimes, I'm, maybe let's just say that car had $200 damage. I just want to pay for it myself. I don't want to involve my insurance company. 
that's okay sometimes, but I would still always suggest always get the insurance information um, when you're, you know, when you're, no matter what, get the insurance. Maybe, maybe I told the lady, I'll just pay the $200 to have it buffed or whatever. That's fine. Get the insurance information and you have it just in case I go haywire and change my mind. So Yeah, or if you get into the repair and it's more costly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, when we come back, we're taking calls, 602-277-5827, and we're talking body shop. Any questions? We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, your KTAR car guy. Dave Riccio took the weekend off, so I've brought Kevin Rowe from I-17 Collision to come help out, along with Tim Nelson from Virginia Auto Service. And we're talking cars today like we do every single Saturday but today is a day that if you've got a bodywork or a paint question especially we can Kevin is here to help you at 602-277-5827 now Dave took the day off he he always chomps at the bit for the transmission questions but I can handle some of those too and and uh, Tim runs the the shop at Virginia Auto so he although he's dangerous with a wrench he knows <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to take care of people and and do things right so Again, we've got open lines. We've seen a couple of people dropped out at 277-5827. And, Kevin, mm-hmm. one thing that I think is really cool about your, your body shop, well, about you. I mean, I was a tech at Camelback Porsche, mm-hmm. and you worked at the body shop who did the repairs for Camelback Porsche. That was 1994. We were a couple of kids back then. Yeah. And you actually fixed at the not your body shop now, but the place you work, fixed mm-hmm. my Mustang when I wrecked it. And, again, my fault. <laughs> and uh, did a bad job. Mm-hmm. And what the way the reason I like Kevin today, and we have this friendship and relationship through business, is the manager, the owner of that shop, was not taking responsibility. Kevin was the one being my advocate, telling his boss, "Dude, this isn't right." Yeah, I mean, so ever since and then I left, came back, Porsche closed. I opened the shop, and uh, you've been an I seventeen now for. Thir- I mean, yeah, I've owned it for about thirteen years now, and managed it for a few years, a few before, years before that. Before yeah. that, uh-huh. so and now, but you're not on I seventeen. You used to be right off of I seventeen. Yeah, you're not quite right off. You're right off I seventeen and I seventeen and Peoria. Peoria. I, actually, yeah, just east of I seventeen on Twenty Third Avenue. Yeah, we uh, started in that little shop and uh, outgrew it. Thankfully, so we've uh, you, you know come a, come a long way in the in the last few years. So. Good. All right. Well, let's help Brian from Phoenix. Brian's got a 2005, looks like a Dodge 250 pickup. What can we help you with, Brian? I'm struggling with this truck. It's in really good condition. I don't want to get rid of it, but it's... uh it cuts out when I. It takes about 20 minutes of highway driving and about 2,000 RPM, and it will cut out, and it'll actually ding my message center, and a light will flash on there, and it looks like a tow haul light, and and it won't leave any any message. So I've had it at Dodge a couple times, and I've had it at Southwest Diesel, and they cannot get it to replicate this problem, and uh, it has kind of quit doing it now in the winter months and it just did it yesterday on my way home and uh so i i I was told by a friend to call in and see what you know (laughs) what you guys can do so put us to uh, the test huh when when this thing shuts off does it like slowly drag out like it's starving and choking out or is it just like a light switch boom it's dead it's a instantaneous quick little shutter and it actually, at one point, I thought maybe it was the transmission slipping because I was looking at my RPM gauge when it did it, and it kind of jumped up and it went, you know, went up and came right back down. And it's never actually shut off. The Dodge dealership informed me that that might be what has to happen in order to fix it, and I, <laughs> I wasn't too happy with that answer. So, does it actually does the engine shut off, or it just loses the ability to power and go? It just loses its power, and it's just for just a split second. And uh, and it's never actually quit on me. And like I said, I'm afraid to leave town with it. You know, yeah. I've got a trailer, and I'm just afraid to take it anywhere. Well, and in- intermittent problems, I, I, I think it's a case that it's not that they can't fix it or they can't figure it out. It's that it's not happening to them while exactly. it's there, right? Okay. Exactly. Well, that's the most challenging thing in the shop, and Tim's looking at me with his face. We have a... A, a Chevy Duramax truck in our shop now. We can't get it to st- – it It won't do it's it. It's doing a similar thing too also. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just like every th- – I mean literally every fourth week, out of the blue, for no reason, it just shuts off on the guy. So, I mean that's that's a difficult one. 
if it was more frequent, I might refer you to a place like Automotive Diagnostic Specialties in Channel or where they have a dyno where they can actually drive it on the dyno. Um, some of the things I'm thinking about, though, when if it just shuts off instantaneously, that would be electric, not uh, not starving for fuel or anything like that. So maybe as you're driving, you could play with that tow haul switch a little bit. Maybe you can get it to act up, maybe wiggle the shifter. I'm not going from reverse to neutral or anything like that while you're driving or drive. Uh, wiggle the key. Ignition switches have funny problems. That might be something that, that would help you. So hopefully that helps. And if it, if when you get to the problem, we'd like to hear the answer. Maybe you can go to bumper to bumperradiocom and send us an email. It's always nice to hear about the weird things and, and what fixes them. So, Brian, thanks for the call. We're going to go with David on a 2005 Escalade. David, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. What can we help you with? Hey, guys. Thanks very much. I... Uh damaged my taillight uh, quite some time ago and used the standard shade tree mechanic method of holding it on until I got it fixed, namely duct tape. Now, did you at least, how do I get, <laughs> did you at least I, use red duct yeah. tape? Uh, no, actually it was um, white and gray. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I, was, I was looking for black to match the paint, but I couldn't find it. Uh, anyway, it's replaced, but I have a lot of duct tape residue on the paint. How do I get that off safely without damaging the paint? There's a, a couple of things that you can do with that. Um, there's at an auto body supply store, they have something that's called uh, Acrosol. And it's kind of like a goof off, but it's more made for uh, uh, to be used on paint, uh, painted panels. And it doesn't hurt, hurt the paint, but it takes up all that residue. It'll take it off the plastic. And if there's any on the actual body panels themselves, um, that's that's probably the safest method. Some people will use just straight lacquer thinner. I don't usually recommend that because that, if you're not well, careful, that can damage some stuff. It'll, it could eat up the clear coat, or it takes the the wax off too. Yeah, I mean, yeah it'll could... take the wax off, and it, and on some plastic surfaces, it'll just cause it to basically melt. Well, it just depends on what you're using it on. So goof off, careful. goof off was my original thought. Mm -hmm. But what about? I mean, I've used just WD forty. Um, what do you think about that? I keep away from WD-40 in the shop because that's a silicone-based thing, and we're petroleum-based. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That will that'll, could that ruin will rubber. Yeah. Yeah. And when in in our environment down at the shop, that stuff gets in the air, and it'll actually find its way into my paint booth. Ah, it, so. it atomizes and it just travels everywhere. So anything that's petroleum or silicone based stays out of my shop just that's, because that's it's like a it's a refinish. Yeah, exactly. It's a refinishing environment, so we can't use that stuff. So we use for us at the shop we use Acrosol, um, and you can find that at auto body supply stores and paint supply stores. For I think Napa has even yeah they'll have a version of, of that. Stuff like yeah. That. Mm -hmm. yeah. So any 3M products? Well, that's a good question, and and so when people are replacing, like you get that one off tail light. Mm -hmm. There's aftermarket, and yep. then there's brand new. Yep. Is, is there a difference on a taillight or a headlight, for example? Um, yeah, sometimes the way the sometimes the way it actually fits will be a little bit different, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes the way the actual colors look and the, the lenses will look a little bit different. But it's one of those cost to benefit type of a things. If you're paying out of your pocket, um, as long as the uh, as long as it's a good fitting product you should be all right going aftermarket right well and i see you know we will use i like original equipment parts and we can talk about that a little more mm -hmm. later but it's okay sometimes to use an aftermarket maybe it's better to use an original equipment the one i see when people should do two lenses like you see the car that just got out of the body shop and one lens is brand new and the other one's nice and yellow yep well we've got open phone 602-277-5827 277 ktar and we're talking body shop body work anything automotive we'll see you in a bit well welcome back to bumper to bumper radio and this, i'll call this the we don't have any snow in phoenix edition and eat your heart out boston <laughs> thank god of edition of bumper to bumper radio yeah i am so glad that i live where there isn't any snow but i can certainly go visit it if i want to but kevin I would imagine that if I-17 ran through the Northeast right now, body shop business would have an uptick maybe? Oh, they'd be, yeah, their <laughs> body shops are going to be pretty busy after this one. Do you, is, is it, do you see cycles? Is there anything to the snowbirds coming to town, the snowbirds leaving town, the monsoons? What makes your business cycle? There is a big correlation to my <laughs> how busy my shop is <laughs> right around those uh, times when the uh, winter visitors are here. It's it's – I. For me, it's uh, what I've noticed is the university, the schools, 
and the uh, snowbirds coming back to town, there's just a lot more congestion on the roads. It's not any one per. It's not like oh, the darn snowbirds or those no. students. It's just there's more just, congestion, yeah. more traffic. Yeah, you notice it on your drive into into work in the mornings during the summer. For me, I just you know the, the traffic is just way lighter. Right. Well, there's there's what I say. I got the, I'm a race fan. It's those people. You know, I got my saying about those people that are going to get in a wreck and the ones that have or whatever it was. Yeah. It's a, I think that's a Daryl Waltrip. Uh, you know, those who have hit the wall and those who haven't hit it yet. Yeah. But same thing with an accident. Either you've been in an automobile accident or you're going to have one. Mm-hmm. So you want to know the guy that you need to call. And Kevin's that guy. So in your phone right now, you should program I-17 Collision. If you're anywhere west of 16th Street, west of Central, it doesn't really matter because Body Shop is a destination. It's not a quick work. So if it's five miles away or 15 miles away, it's still going to be a week. So who cares? That's right. I-17 Collision, I-17 Peoria is the people you want to know. So we've got lots of calls here. And first, we are going to help Charlene with her 2010 Toyota Sienna. Charlene, thanks for being patient. And what can we help you with? Hi. Um, I have a power steering belt that when I turn the wheel, it squeals. And when I took it in for an oil change, I asked them about it. And they said that the belt is glazed and that I should change it. And I just wondered if it's really necessary to change it. Well, how many how many miles are in your 2010 Sienna? About thirty four thousand. About thirty four thousand. Well, I would say that yes, it is necessary to change it, and I say that first, most importantly, because you have a symptom that goes along with it. You had a problem, and they identified it as the belt squeaking. So yes, it's not an example of I had nothing wrong with my car, and now I really don't know why they want to put the belt on. My gut feeling is thirty four thousand. That's thirty four is about about our average time on a belt. Well, I was going to say yeah. it seems a little bit early. Actually, yeah. um, I have a Toyota truck two thousand ten with thirty seven thousand, and I don't have any squeal. Uh, thirty to forty thousand. I'm is that range where they start to, you know, you can't see anymore. The belts, the belts are made differently now. In the rubber, we used to look for cracks, and now we have a tool at the shop that measures the depth of the grooves of the serpentine belt. Right, because that material actually starts to shred off. It kind of wears out like a tire now. Or like Tim said before, we'd be looking at looking at the at the belt and looking for cracks. Well, they don't crack anymore. They just wear out. So for the average person, you may or may not be able to to see um, to see that the belt's bad. And I wouldn't worry about it necessarily on your car as far as the other components. There's a belt system there. There's a tensioner and there's idlers. At 37,000 miles, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with any of those components. But as your car gets up over 100,000 miles, we start looking at replacing those as well because they fail. So, Charlene, I think it'd be just fine. Just go get the belt replaced. Bumper to bumper radio is a good place to look for a shop if you don't have a relationship and a regular shop that you use. And in Chandler, there's ADS right off of I-10 and Chandler Boulevard. And and they're great. And you can go there and, and be comfortable. And then you don't have to wonder. Once you've established that relationship, you know you don't have to worry about it. So, Charlene, thanks for the call. We are going to go next with Melody and Surprise with a 2006 Chrysler. Melody, what can we help you with today? Well, my I've got 170,000 miles on my car, and I drive it for a living. So I'm really good about maintenance and taking care of it. I have a mechanic who I trust implicitly. Good. Um, and last time I, he was doing just some regular stuff and checking things out for me, he said my transmission fluid was starting to smell a little burnt, so I need to go have a transmission flush. He told me to make sure that, on, specifically for my model, that um, they changed the, the filter as well. And I've been to several shops, and none of them changed their filter. They all want to charge me an hour to an hour and a half of labor in addition to the flush, which is around $200, to um, to change that filter. And what I want to know is, you know, who's right? Does the filter really need change <laughs> well, or not? Well, uh, if Dave was here, he would have a strong opinion. And I'll tell you the answer is kind of like Coke or Pepsi, a little bit. Um, the You should change the filter, and you should flush it. And you don't necessarily need to do both of those at the same time or together. The reason you want to change the filter is because you need to see if there's any debris or any any material or anything in that filter. That's going to be a sign of what's happening inside the transmission if there's a problem. That filter can also just get plugged up with the very fine, fine clutch material and the normal wear and tear over time, especially with the mileage you have. That filter can plug up and cause the transmission to starve for fluid. So your friend is right. 
that that told you that you should change the filter and i think maybe you're going to find the industry went that route i think for convenience i don't know if it was was initiated by the jiffy lubes and the quick lubes of the world because they couldn't do transmission services before and now they can kind of so change and the other reason that we changed started flushing is that when you do the pan off service Let's just say your car probably holds 15 quarts of fluid. When you remove the transmission pan and change just the filter, you're only changing, let's say, maybe three to five quarts of that fluid. So my example is like a glass of chocolate milk. You have this nice, rich glass of chocolate milk, and you drink it all the way down to a third maybe, and then go pour fresh milk in and stir it all up again. You probably have another glass of chocolate milk. You didn't get all the fluid out, all the old stuff. So... I think maybe alternating every other and doing it about 20 or 30,000 miles, depending on if you're driving for work. There's a lot of shifting, a lot of stuff happening there. Or occasionally you could do both of them together. And then the other thing on that car, I would make sure you're using the proper fluid. Chrysler is going to call out a fluid, a specific fluid for you. So that's important. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Maybe one is better. Check with a transmission shop or check with one of the bumper-to-bumper radio shops at bumper-to-bumperradio.com. So thanks for the call. We've got open phones at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And next up is Lee on his 2010 Nissan Titan. Lee, what can we help you with? Paul, can uh, can you hear me? I can. What can we help you with? Okay. Uh, I have a 2010 Titan. Uh, I get like 16.8 to the gallon. I have a five point whatever it is engine that they have in this thing it runs okay uh but i read in the paper a couple of years ago or a year ago maybe in january uh about this lady that had some kind of performance an additive uh, not a liquid but something she did to the engine that got her up to 50 percent more mileage and I hope you know what you're. I hope you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and it's not that particular lady. She started a company. Uh, if not that particular lady, somebody else. Or is there a chip that I can put in the truck? Well, that would make it uh, more economical. There may or but there may not be. I don't know which lady you're talking about. So if you find that, if you can research that and let us know, send us an email. That would be great. There's no magic bullet. Um, to to get these manufacturers spend millions and millions of dollars on R and D every year to try and get good gas mileage, and if there was a ninety eight cent or twenty dollar piece they could put on the car to make it double, they would certainly do it because they would sell a heck of a lot more cars. So I doubt that there is anything. The only the things that you can do to to keep and maintain your mileage are things like tire pressure. Right, Tim? I mean, yeah. tire pressure. It's changing your oil. Change, keeping the oil maintained. Uh, air filter. Uh, just and, your, and your driving habits, too. That's a big thing. Big the, time. The way, the way you drive. If you're on, on, the, on the gas, off the, on the brake, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to hit the light. You're trying to miss the, you know, that hurry, kind of stuff. Hurry up and wait. Well, you yeah. know, and if you change your driving habits, you might not have to go see Kevin. <laughs> Don't change your driving habits. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, good good. Good question, but I'm just not a, a big believer in a, in a lot of the additives and that type of stuff. So, uh, Scott and Gilbert, we are going to help you with your 2003 Suzuki. You know, I saw a Suzuki Akashi the other day, and I thought that's a pretty cool car. What can we help you with, Scott? <laughs> yeah. Go, go ahead. What can we help you with? Uh, well, I've got a 2003 Suzuki Aereo, like you're saying, and I actually I do most of my own maintenance, and I took the took it took my car in and I actually asked, hey, what are the procedures on on changing the, the transmission fluid and changing the filter? And, and when the last caller called in, that's what made me think of this. But they said there actually is no filter on your car. And I just thought, that seems so bizarre. I, I, there's got to be a transmission filter on every car, right? Or well, no? yes and no. And what they may mean is that there's not a serviceable filter on your car. And it may just have a metal screen too. They're just like your window on your at your house. The screen, although it's you know it's real metal or some kind of reinforced material. But for example, uh, Hondas forever, Honda Accord, Civic, whatever. They're just a drain and fill service. There is a filter, but the only way to change that filter is you're actually splitting the transmission case apart. 
it's not designed to be part of regular maintenance. So yeah, not economical. <laughs> not, not even at all. close. That's yeah, it's not even a, <laughs> a thing to consider. So so they very well may be right. And so maybe that's the question. Is this a permanent filter or or when you say there's not one, is it just not one that needs to be serviced? And then same thing, you're gonna typically just drain and fill that fluid. And again, a lot of these fluids are very vehicle specific. So you just want to make sure you're using the right fluid. So thanks for the call. Jim and Gilbert on a 2001 Ford Taurus. Jim, what can we help you with? Hi, thanks for uh, taking the call. Um, I drove my uh, Ford to work one day and drove. I hadn't, hadn't had any problems. Uh, it, later at the end of the day, I drove it over to the supermarket, came back out, and it wouldn't start up. Um, I came, I left it there overnight, and I was came back the next day, and I was prepared to tow it, and it started right up and surprised me. Um, I drove it home, and then the next day, again, it wouldn't start up, and I haven't been able to get it to start. It cranks strong and everything. Um, one little thing that I read on the Internet, I don't know if, it, if it's valid or not, I tried um, – uh, I had I, I had suspicions on a fuel pump, so I took off my gas cap and had somebody turn it on and off. And supposedly you can hear a slight hum sometimes if you listen to the gas cap for a couple of seconds. And I didn't hear anything. What okay. do you think? Well, I mean, we get we need it's in one sense, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It's good that it died, and and that it won't start now because that makes it a lot easier. Typically, when you turn the key on. On initial startup, that first, you know, don't crank it. Just turn the key on. You are going to get like a three-second buzz. And if you're not hearing that, that's maybe an indication. I wouldn't take that to the bank, but I would provide that information to the shop that you go to. Before, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't use hang my hat on that and then go put a seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollar fuel pump in the car, whatever it costs. You definitely want to have it checked first, but that's a good indicator. And then that doesn't mean it's the fuel pump. It could be a relay. The computer is what sends the signal to the relay to activate the fuel pump. So it could be that. Um, just, again, in another shop in your area, one of the great bumper-to-bumper -bumper shops is Desert Car Care in Gilbert. You can give them a shot. And Bob, Dave, John, and Bernadette, you'll be up next. When we come back, you'll listen to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio, and we have got a full board of calls today, and we are talking about Body Shop. Although, Kevin, not many people are having Body Shop or Accident Collisions or uh, questions, so I guess yeah, maybe that's good, I guess, depending on, on which end yeah. of the, the, the stick you're on. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the thing, too, that I want people to remember is I-17 collision is not just for when you have an accident and your car is all b banged up. Mm -hmm. All the time, Kevin is at our shop at Virginia Auto Service looking at cars. Yep. If you were at the gas station and you bumped into the pole and messed up your door, you clipped the corner of your garage or you name it and there's a scuff on the fender, I think we need to have like one – we need to set up like a set date because, I mean, it seems like you're at the shop three or four times a week looking yeah. at cars sometimes. Yeah, so. yeah, and yours isn't the only one I go to. Yeah, we chase all over the place uh, stopping at shops and at people's homes or businesses, uh, writing estimates, taking a look at their cars for them. Yeah, yeah. so, about, for example, you're at Dave's Car Care, one of the bumper-to-bumper -bumper shops. He's yep. just right down the road from you. Yep. If you're in there, call – Kevin, say, hey, man, my car is over there. Or call or Dave. Dave, can you have Kevin from I-17 come look at my car? Um, you're happy to do that and and, uh, and mm -hmm. give him estimates, and we can pick up and deliver and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's not just when you're in an accident. So we're going to get to the phones, and we have Bernadette up first from Scottsdale on a Nissan Maxima. Bernadette, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I really just wanted your opinion and uh, see if um, – I've, I've taken my car in a few times because the check engine light keeps coming on. And the first time they fixed a leak in a vacuum hose, and then it came on again, and we changed an O2 sensor. And it came on again, and we, I just took it in, and they changed uh, the MAF sensor. Okay. And then the light's on again, and I'm assuming all for the same code or the same type of problem? Yes. It was a loose ground they finally found in the MAF sensor. It, okay, and that's what finally fixed it? Yes, as far as I know, it hasn't come back on again. Okay, well, that's a good thing. So your question is? Well, does it, 
does it sound normal to have to chase it around? I mean, is that just one of those things? Well, it, it is, and it, it, it is normal. It's, it's all of those. <laughs> it's abnormal. It's, I mean, the benefit of hindsight, 2020 hindsight, it's very easy for me to form an opinion now after somebody else has struggled. So it happens. Sometimes it's a multi-step repair. If they fixed a vacuum leak, it's because you had had a vacuum leak. And I think sometimes what shops do, and we're guilty of it too, and when I say guilty, not in a bad way, we have a misfire, for example, and we go and we find this problem, and we see where the spark plug wire is arcing. Well, that's got to be it. We put the blinders on, so to speak, and we don't go far enough. You know what I mean? And uh, And then so we have to come back and fix the car again, maybe do another repair. Sounds like in that case the – the ground wire could have been the problem all along, and now I think maybe you're asking, did I really need all that work? Well, I don't know. I, I really don't know. That's something that maybe you go back and ask the shop. Is there something that you did that maybe I shouldn't be paying for? I'm glad they fixed it for you. But unless I know all the details, I certainly don't want to come second guess what somebody else has done because I don't know all the details. But it's a good question. I'm glad you stuck with them. I'm glad the car's fixed. If, it, if you feel like it's worth it, it's certainly worth having a very nice conversation, not on a Monday morning or a Friday morning when they're busy, and just go talk to the manager and, and see if there's something. Have him explain. That's what you should do is always ask questions and understand. Don't feel like you're being a pest. That's their job to help you. You've paid them, and they need to help you. So thanks for the call, Bernadette. And if you would, if you want to send me an email at bumpertobumperradio.com, go there, go to the Contact tab. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'll certainly help you or, or try and walk you through or give you some guidance with, with how that – I'd like to know how it turns out for you. So thanks again for the call. And John in Mesa on a 2002 Accord. What can we help you with today, John? I got to, uh, my Accord. When I, when I have the air conditioning on and I get to a stop sign of light, you know, the thing just vibrates. The steering wheel vibrates bad. So I took it to the Honda dealer and they tested it against another one. They said, yeah, they do that. That's about – that's normal. So I went to my mechanic, and he said he feels it's, it's motor mounts. He said the two side ones are usually what does it, but um, I want to know what you think. Well, that's what I was originally going to say was motor mount or engine mount. And back when, you know, when I was starting to learn mid, early 80s, 90s, the advent of the front-wheel drive car and the Hondas were really popular – People would come in, and, they, and that's back when we did tune-ups. You know, you put in a spark plugs, you set the timing, and, and you had to mechanically do all that, that tune-up work. People would come in and say, gee, I need a tune-up. No, you don't need a tune-up. The car runs fine. No, it runs rough. No, 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 that's not the engine running rough. The car runs great. You put it in drive, it has a vibration. So very likely it's motor mounts. And it's not like when the dealer told you it's normal. That's not nothing. Nothing. No vibrations. Normal. Maybe it's normal that that's happening when the mounts are worn out. Right. Maybe they it, didn't finish for you. Yeah. It's 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 normal when the mounts are bad, but it's definitely not something you want to let go. What we find, no, the engine's not going to fall out on the ground or anything like that. You're not going to not going to have issues like that. But in extreme cases, you'll get where they break and the engine lifts up every time you accelerate. That engine is going to want to twist out of the car. And literally, it's not going to come out of the car. But it just it causes other vibrations that the, the uh, can damage in it, some of the components, wiring and stuff like that. Yeah, we've seen them pull on wiring harnesses, pull on air boots. They, um, you know, and then it just makes the car a rattle trap sometimes. So it's very likely the mounts. Um, the other thing, and this is a topic to Kevin that we were talking about, and we have an email. It was uh, Tanya wrote in saying, "My car was wrecked, and they want to use some used parts." My husband says, "No way. What should I do?" Now, we're not talking used parts necessarily here uh, on the motor mount thing, but that leads more into the aftermarket comment that I'm going to make. But, Kevin, what do you think about using used parts in the body shop arena? With used parts, I as long as they come from a source that is a, a good salvage yard, a good, uh, a good uh, recycling yard, if they come in clean where I don't have to do a whole bunch of work to them to take uh, – uh, a bad part and make it good as long as it comes in clean i prefer to use that over aftermarket parts because it came say it's, it came off of a toyota the toyota fender it, it's off of another vehicle that was made by uh, toyota the sheet metal is the same the same uh, gauge the corrosion protection is going to be the same and it's going to fit properly without 
any weird gaps or anything. Well, right. And what I was going to say, if I my two thousand, if I would have wrecked my truck yesterday, actually wrecked it, I would prefer a used Toyota two thousand ten out of a salvage yard fender mm-hmm. than I would a brand new aftermarket. Yep. And the point I'm making here though is that used parts are okay yep. in those in those cases. In the mechanical world, we're always or most of the time using mechanical parts, except for one time, motor mounts. Fat, factory okay. only. Yeah, factory only, original motor mounts, and, and that's it. Body shop stuff, it's okay. Well, thank you again, Kevin, I-17 Inclusion, for Thanks, joining Matt. us. Great that you had here, and Bumper to Bumper Radio, we'll be back next week.